Hello everybody, it is Anna. Today I'm going to be reviewing The Sandman Book 4, The Season of Mists. Now this is a book that I've been looking forward to quite a while because I've heard quite great things about this and in fact, a lot of them are true and a lot of them are not. Let's get into it. What's different about this story is that it's really interesting in that many of the Sandman stories really feel more like an anthology than a full series. Each of the Sandman books does not completely flow from one story to the next. Some volumes do this better than others, but in general, they don't fit together completely cohesively. Sandman seems more about the influence of Sandman's presence on the universe rather than Sandman's existence itself. That seems to be the way it goes, except for this story. In Season of the Mist, we basically follow Sandman or Morpheus throughout his entire adventure. First thing I wanna point out is that this story is a lot slower than every other Sandman story I've read. The reason being, of course, it's one larger narrative. And because of that, there's a lot more going into it and a lot more buildup and a lot more stuff going on at the same time. That's just how it tends to be with the longer stuff. So it makes sense, but at the same time, I do feel that it did have a lot of drawbacks. First of all, what an interesting story. The idea itself is just great. And the reason I say this is because the amount of spin-offs this one volume alone has gotten with specifically Lucifer Morningstar, it is just exquisite. How interesting, how original an idea that Neil Gaiman brought to the table. It's such an interesting idea because it really does resemble the idea of an actual myth. Now, everybody knows this, but in case you don't, Neil Gaiman does actually draw a lot from mythology and not just in a way that most authors do. He was really, really interested in myths. Uh, and above all, I think that those were his founding influence in writing. So when you see a story like this, you already recognize it as literally a myth brought to life in the comic format. It's almost as if it is a legend being written. Now, the difficulty with that is that a legend being written doesn't exist. You don't see legends being written. Now this story really does bear the resemblance to something that is attempting to be that while being unable to actually attain that, which I don't fault it for, but at the same time, it just doesn't match that kind of level. You can see that that's what it's aiming for and because of that, it really misses in some ways. The mythological idea of this plotline is really, really interesting because what it does is it plants one single seed and then what it does from there it just expands on that single seed and sees the ripple effect of what actually happens. So there's an initial conflict that's an interesting conflict. I quite enjoyed that. I found the initial scene or the first story in this volume to be great. It was, it was extremely engrossing, very uh, detail oriented and very exposition-y. And I found that very interesting just because of how interesting the exposition was. Like you can have exposition about like carpets and stuff. That's kind of boring. But if you have exposition about destiny himself, that's a little bit more interesting. Moving forward from that, we begin to go into the actual story, which is another plot line opens up. When this other plot line opens up, it's kind of the second story in that is kind of an explanation for what is about to come. And then in in the third story, we finally see the real big plotline of the entire Seasons of Mist storyline. And we see that it's really, really unexpected, and we don't really completely understand where it's coming from. The important thing is, now what? This completely changes the tide, and that's where the real story comes from. Now, each of these two plotlines that I've talked about really have a really strong mythological foundation, and that's why I enjoy them so much. The difficulty is when you try to put these two together. The first one on its own is great. The second one on its own is also great. Then I begin to have some difficulty in thinking, well, was it a good idea to put them together? And I'm not sure about the answer to that, uh, but what I will say, which I can't say for sure, is that I forgot about the first plot line. Uh, it completely slipped my mind because the second plot line was taking such precedence against all of the other stuff going on that it was just too important for me to go back and think about what was actually happening. We were focused on now, and because of that, the plotline that wasn't really being actively explored, despite the fact that it was the foundational narrative for this story, just didn't have any screen time at all. And then this is where I come to the real problem of this mythological story. So the second one is really what it feels like the story is about, despite the fact that the first storyline, the one that kind of wraps everything together, although it's not really present, that seems to be the actual storyline, because if not, then Neil Gaiman doesn't know anything about story structure, but obviously it is because, you know, that's what it is. It just didn't have enough of an impact. Anyway, so getting back to this, in the second storyline, I found that there were some problems, specifically with pacing. Now, I know there's a lot of people who really, really love this story, so I don't mean to demean them in any way, but when I say this, I, I mean it really technically, which is that in each individual story within the volume, very little actually happens. And that's a very interesting thing to think about because I read an introduction from book five because I'm, I'm way beyond this point right now. I'm recording videos way after. It said something about every single line in Sandman, despite not all of it being extremely important in the moment, is extremely profound. And I found that to be completely true in so many different cases. But in this case, there was just a lot of dialogue and a lot of stuff that goes on between two characters or between one character, Morpheus, and some other uh, character, X, Y, Z, or whoever. And each of these conversations is meant to be really, really impactful. And that seems to be the entire story, it's just these conversations. But when we come to the end of it, it seems like none of these conversations had any impact. And even while we were reading all the stories, the idea was, well, not many of these are gonna have much impact. Only one of them is gonna have much impact because of the nature of what this plotline is. 
And so why are we focusing on so much and why are we taking so much time to read and learn all these details when in fact it doesn't even matter, it's not even that interesting, it's just there. It seems like the content that he had prepared was actually these conversations. Maybe Neil Gaiman found them interesting, like Sandman talking to Anubis, maybe that's interesting to him. But to most people I feel like that's just not that interesting, especially because it doesn't have anything to do really with each of these people, it just has to do with their situation. And so I found that really, really neandering and kind of boring in many ways. Now, when this was finally all wrapped up, we came back to the point where we realized that none of that really mattered. By the end of the day, I don't even remember any of the conversation. Most of those pages and, th and stories and people have completely left my mind because it's just not interesting. What happened at the end kind of made most of the stuff before it irrelevant. And then after this plotline is concluded, which is a pretty good conclusion, I wasn't very enthralled by it, there was another conclusion for the first original story that I completely forgot about. And then this one was a great conclusion. I very much enjoyed that. And so it finally wrapped up all the stories and finally we come together to a cohesive narrative. And at the end of the day, this wasn't the greatest Sandman story. Um, it was really, really cool and really interesting in a lot of ways, but it really didn't do much for me overall. This Sandman story is going to get a 2 out of 5 stars for me, just because it felt very neandering in a lot of points, in a very large chunk of the middle towards the end, uh, in that area, it felt very neandering, and the plotline that we were supposed to be remembering right from the beginning was forgotten. And for that reason, it is a 2 star. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more Sandman content, make sure to subscribe and check out my channel for the previous reviews in this series and other fantasy reviews as well. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button down below. And if you either agree or disagree with my point of view, I would love to discuss it in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to follow me on Goodreads in the description down below, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.